Module PHLB, Lecture 2, Domestic Waste. In a recent class discussion, one of our students referenced the achievement of New York University environmental science student Lauren Singer, who CNN celebrated in their Going Green feature as one of our planet's green champions. Her claim to fame was reducing the amount of packaging that she brought home over four years so that she could fit each year's worth in one mason jar. Now that is dedication. So much of our so-called domestic waste is unnecessary. Bulk shopping has existed since time immemorial, and here in Florida, outlets like Bulk Nation, which has branches in Brandon, Largo, and Lakewood in our region, cater to people who want to eliminate much single-use plastic and other packaging. In Europe, of course, fresh fruit and vegetables are displayed and purchased without packaging. Shoppers have been using their own reusable shopping bags for decades, and Plastic or paper bags in the stores are available at a price that reflects the social and environmental costs they might cause and so disincentivize use. Oh, and stores like Aldi have unpackaging stations before you leave the store, large tables next to recycling bins where you remove as much packaging as you can before leaving and make it the store's responsibility to get the materials back into the supply chain. On every street corner, there are specific color-coded recycle bins, and it's a point of pride among Europeans to do as much pre-cleaning and sorting as possible. And because many European countries, Germany and Denmark and Sweden in particular, have such a robust infrastructure of municipal and rural biodigesters and commercial composting operations to complement their culturally expected backyard composting and their massive wind turbine and solar electric and solar thermal infrastructures, there's little organic waste to speak of. They have green bins for that which decomposes from the home or garden or street, and so their other garbage isn't contaminated and therefore not refused by recycling centers. When I visited Manila in the Philippines back in 2011, I saw something that convinced me that many so-called developing countries were already outstripping the Northwest European hegemonic cultures when it came to problem solving. I decided to take a public transit one day out to the largest landfill in the world, the so-called Smoky Mountain Landfill, several hours away from the central city. There I was astounded to learn that not only were the Filipinos implementing a new biogas project for electricity generation from landfill gas and training the local garbage picker communities to source separate to increase efficiency, but the garbage trucks arriving there every few minutes all had massive posters on their side saying, if you haven't separated, we won't pick up your trash. It was a bold statement by the municipality, backed by the kind of disciplinary action that we should all be subject to. You made your own mess. If you aren't responsible enough to help clean things, then go ahead and wallow in it. San Francisco is one of the few American cities I've spent time in that does the same thing. Last year, when my wife and I arrived for the annual Google Science Fair that I've always been one of the judges for, we noticed immediately that the airport had special bins for organics and other bins for clean, or re clean recyclables. The restaurants and fast food courts didn't have any single-use plastics. All of our packaging was compostable. They even had attendants at the recycling bins directing patrons where and how to properly place, not dispose of, their residuals. The attendants we talked to were knowledgeable and friendly, providing more of a free education than any kind of admonition. In the city, outside my cousin's apartment, we found that those families that didn't carefully clean and sort their garbage and properly put them in the right place, including the green bin for all the organics, would come outside to find a colorful and pleasantly worded brochure explaining where things should have gone and warning them that Next time, their garbage would simply be left behind until they got into compliance. It was such a contrast to what we'd seen in all the other U.S. airports and cities that we'd been flying into and out of. And when I talked to restaurant vendors and cleaning staff and to my cousin and her neighbors and to city sanitation workers, they all had nothing but positive things to say. Why should the carelessness and irresponsibility of the so-called consumer be rewarded or supported or aided and abetted. Just what kind of perverse incentive program have we been running all these years? As I've mentioned in class before, there actually are garbage mafias in most cities 
who make most of their money through the increasing value of ever decreasing or scarce land for landfill. It's really about land speculation and what has been a fairly inelastic market using the classic scarcity model. As long as people think goods turn into bads that need disposal and the spaces available for disposal are running out, those who control the flow of those bads from cradle to grave will profit handsomely. Naples, Italy, which has been lurching from garbage crisis to crisis for decades, is a classic example, with the Camorra Mafia gang controlling the garbage market. As one article points out, quote, the Camorra isn't actually that interested in household waste, but it is interested in controlling the waste cycle, controlling the dumps. Camorra gangs have also bought land at knocked down prices from intimidated small landowners and sold it at a huge profit to companies involved in stocking bales of waste. End quote. <clears throat> But you get a dual bonnet. So now this module of our class is concerned with the anthropology of waste as it concerns domestic wastes. The wastes you, no longer me so much, produce at home while the next module unpacks the anthropology of industrial wastes. It would be nice if they were so evenly divided, but alas the world is far more complex than that. As the Naples case shows, mixing waste streams particularly those that are problematic, dangerous, toxic, is good business for those charging a premium for diminishing landfill space or dump and destroy operations that nobody wants in their backyard. Quote, the Camorra filled the dumps, not just with household trash, but also with industrial waste trucked in from around Italy. This traffic remains one of the most, one of organized crime's most lucrative activities, rivaling and possibly exceeding narcotics for profitability. End quote, says the article. Quote, the gangsters still make fortunes in waste transport, and as they no longer run the dumps by dumping and burning toxic refuse in the countryside, they make their money, which is a major source of pollution blamed for higher than normal rates of certain cancers in the region. End quote. If our domestic consumption residuals were properly cleaned and sorted, they would be profitably collected and brought to remanufacture centers as valuable feedstock. Without the organic residues on them, most of them wouldn't create a hazard and could sit indefinitely in locations where they could be brought back into an industrial ecology, and it's unlikely anybody would allow them to get mixed in with industrial waste. The volume reductions for unpleasant household trash would make it obvious when unscrupulous players were trying to smuggle in hazardous industrial waste. But first, you would have to convince people that household wastes were valuable enough to keep out of the landfill waste stream and thereby starve the mafias of the material for their cover-up. I've mentioned endlessly that the first and best way to do that is simply separate the organics from the inorganics and clean the inorganics so they aren't contaminated by anything that can putrefy. I learned how important this was from the Zabaline Trash Recycling Society with whom I did my PhD research. The very dignity and safety of whose lives depends on the public taking the responsibility to keep the organics and the inorganics separate. In their community, it isn't academic. One of my friends in Solar City's NGO co-founders lost his baby niece in her crib to rat bites. Like the rats that caused bubonic plague in Europe and, and like the horrors of cholera that killed tens of thousands in Haiti not so long ago, these tragedies simply can't happen when so-called organic wastes food and toilet residuals are properly transformed into fuel and fertilizer. Once you take the pledge to safely eliminate your organic waste by transforming them from bads into goods, you will no doubt begin to look at your domestic consumption residuals in a different way. The first thing that you will notice is that they never smell. Ever. Full stop. No smell. Clean plastic, with the possible exception of new and still off-gassing polyvinyl chloride shower curtains and pool toys and furniture covers and such, give off no odors. You already knew that on a visceral level with clean glass or metal, and you could get your mind around it with paper and cardboard. Can you think of any home or domestic garbage you produce that couldn't sit for months and months around your house, on your porch or patio, in the garage or backyard without causing you anything more than a space problem? Toxic chemicals aside, which you in this class can certainly avoid in your household kitchen and bathroom cleaning products, is there anything you can't hang on to 
without any worries about health and safety? And let's talk about kitchens and bathrooms for a moment. When we talk about domestic wastes, about household garbage, about the kinds of trash that you personally are responsible for, does your mind go to your bedroom as the source of the problem? The living room? The playroom? The den? The dining room? Or does your worry about a human population moving toward 9 billion really have to do with what you have seen yourself and your family and all your friends throw away every day into the trash from the kitchen and the bathroom? Oh yeah, the living room may see small spikes and wrappings and packaging around the Christmas tree or menorah each holiday season, and the dining room table may get stacked with boxes and ribbons and PET plastic containers on your birthday each year, but that stuff is usually minimal in volume and clean and dry and easily recycled. The sticky, icky stuff and the toxic stuff, apart from the garage when you're working on a home building project or working on your car, inevitably comes from your kitchen and bathroom. Don't get me started on the washing machine or, or the garden. If you're still using phosphate-rich or non-biodegradable detergents to wash your clothes, and if you're using toxic chemical fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides in your garden, and you're studying sustainability, then, well, uh, I mean, just stop. And anyway, there are licensed locations, certified collection centers, or CCCs, for disposing of hazardous waste. Our local library takes batteries. Many service stations take your motor oil, as do many curbside pickups. There is no excuse for any of us contributing domestic toxins to our air, land, or water. Now, your problems emanate from your kitchens and bathrooms, from the single bins most of you keep in these sacred rooms of ritual, throwing together in the mess of mix all manner of organic and inorganic yick, to the yawning drains of your sinks and showers, to the black hole of your toilet, where all manners of poisonous materials and medicinals and cosmetics mingle with otherwise valuable nutrients that you just don't see the value of or that you don't know how to make use of. Besides that, let's be honest, what you're really worried about are plastics. And not all of them either, mostly the number sevens, the composite plastics in chips bags and wrappers and razors and toothbrushes and plasticized milk and juice cartons and other monstrous hybrids. The stuff no curbside recycler wants to pick up because the cost of separation exceeds the value of the recoverables. The others, the ones with the little recycling labels, number one through six, PET, EHD, PE, PVC, LDPE, PPPS, if cleaned and sorted, which is easy because they have those embossed symbols on them, if only more people would use them. It's kind of like color by numbers. You don't have to be in any way artistic or scientific. But even if you didn't sort them by number, as long as they're clean, workers on the other end have little problem doing what you should have, could have, would have. But here's the thing. Even if you didn't sort your plastics to make them profitable for others to recycle, do you really want to throw them away? I mean, do you really want to give them away? This is a non-trivial question. By now, we've all learned that plastics are petroleum products that they're made from oil, from fossil fuels, fossil materials that are limited and messy and toxic, and thankfully, in a way, running out. Good riddance when they're gone, say some people. Leave them in the ground, say others. Every time we recycle plastics, we forego the mining or pumping and transport of new so-called virgin oil. But what many people don't know is that plastics can be turned back into oil, and they don't seem to know what a simple process it is. The plastic to oil process, look it up, is a simple matter of thermal decomposition under anaerobic or air-free conditions. Get most plastics slowly heated to about 450 Celsius in the absence of oxygen, and rather than just melting or burning, they pyrolyze and gasify, and then condense from polymers into monomers. They turn back into oil. It's so easy to do that a small backyard chemist turned businessman named Adeshe Abaje in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, has local kids scavenging the streets for him and turns the dirty plastic they bring him into fuel for minibuses. He built the system out of old oil drums, literally in his backyard. In his news report and TED Talk, he points out how the streets of his town are getting so clean now that he has had to start employing kids to scavenge in Nazareth to get the needed plastic waste. Meanwhile, a high school kid in the Midwest developed a similar system in his backyard for a science class project. 
while we at Rosebud Continuum Echo Science Center have the Japanese desktop blessed plastic to oil machine to demonstrate the method. Ours is much more expensive than the backyard models because it has a precious metal based catalytic converter on it to ensure that no toxic fumes are released into our environment during operation. But the plastic going into it can't harm you and the oil that comes out could sit in bottles or barrels for millions of years if you like. It is after all oil, the same fossil fuel oil we pulled out of the ground after millions of years to make the plastic. Now, if some Saudi prince offered to give you a few barrels of oil, would you turn him down? Would you throw it away? Or would you sell it? Maybe you would hang on to it for a few years until oil prices went up again. That's how these oil sheiks got rich, right? Before they discovered there was combustible liquid black goop under their desert sands, they were herding camels. The only problem with the oil, like all liquid petroleum, is that it can spill and contaminate water, and it can be easily flammable. Those metal oil drums can corrode and leak. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a safer way to contain and store oil? What if we used a plastic container itself made of oil? Hell, for that matter, what if the oil inside the container were rendered into a solid material that couldn't leak or off-gas or explode? What's that you say? Oh, plastic is oil. The plastics you throw away every day and yet consider such a threat to our oceans and wildlife the plastics that degrade into microplastic particles that get into the food chain, the plastic bags and straws that kill sea turtles and seabirds, all of that is a relatively inert form of solid oil that couldn't hurt anything if it were stored in barrels. So why wouldn't you hang on to it? You wouldn't even have to sort most of it, since eventually it can be turned back into oil, with the exception of number one, PETE, which has a higher decomposition temperature and is better placed in the recycling market to make new bottles or packaging or shoes and t-shirts and other stuff. Oh, and number three, polyvinyl chloride, PVC, which can emit the toxic chlorine gas, better handled by hazardous waste companies with the proper facilities. You can basically keep all the HDPE, LDPE, PP, PS, and other together until you want to sell it, given that it's just oil. Basically, every barrel of plastic you keep is actually a barrel of oil equivalent. So what are you doing throwing barrels of oil away every week and then claiming we're in an oil crisis or running out of oil? We tell ourselves it's because we don't have enough space. And that's only partially true. There are probably about 5,000 cans in this room. Even if your home is small, many of us store things we think are or will be valuable, especially when they aren't hazardous. And most people do store gasoline and oil and other petroleum products from their in their garages, despite the hazards of liquid fuels. Certainly our communities have space somewhere to store solid oil. They just don't think of it that way. Instead, they make huge amounts of useless space available for domestic wastes that they call landfills and dump everything together with no thought of later recovery. They spend millions lining these spaces to try and prevent groundwater contamination, and they put in capture and flaring technology to keep gases from being released to our atmosphere. It never seems to occur to them that if all the organics were cleaned off the garbage beforehand, there would be no chance of the landfill releasing greenhouse gases. No chance of attracting seagulls and other birds and rats and feral dogs and cats and roaches and flies and other vermin. No chance of smelling and causing odor problems for the community or causing disease. And then, if the plastics were clean, it would be fine to put them in a landfill. After all, they came from underground to begin with when they were oil, and now they're even more safely put back in the ground in this solid form called plastic. But why would you? Why would you throw it away? Probably for an anthropological rather than a technical reason. We throw things away because our tribe sees them as impure, as taboo and unclean. Even when we clean our plastics, seeing them in the trash bin makes our tribe deem them unclean and untouchable. Now, I don't want to mislead you into believing that household garbage isn't or can't be dangerous and untouchable. Annie Lennox gives a sobering account of just how bad much of what we bring home really is in The Story of Stuff, the documentary based on the book in our readings. She writes, quote, There are over 100,000 synthetic chemicals in use in commerce today, 
Only a handful of them have even been tested for health impacts, and none have been tested for synergistic health impacts. That means when they interact with all the other chemicals we're exposed to every day. So we don't know the full impact on health and the environment of all these toxic chemicals, but we do know one thing. Toxics in, toxics out. As long as we keep putting toxics into our industrial production systems, we're going to keep getting toxics in the stuff that we bring into our homes and workplaces and schools, and duh, our bodies. Like BFRs, brominated flame retardants, they're a chemical that make things more fireproof, but they are super toxic. They're a neurotoxin. That means toxic to the brain. What are we even doing using a chemical like this? Yet we put it in our computers, our appliances, couches, mattresses, even some pillows. In fact, we take our pillows, we douse them in a neurotoxin, then we bring them home and put our heads on them for eight hours a night to sleep. Now, I don't know, but it seems to me in this country with so much potential, we could think of a better way to stop our heads from catching on fire at night. Now, these toxics build up the food chain and concentrate in our bodies. Do you know what is the food at the top of the food chain with the highest level of many toxic contaminants? Human breast milk. End quote. All this is true. And as a society, we must cease these horrible practices. But as Lennox herself writes immediately after, quote, and of course, the people who bear the biggest brunt of these toxic chemicals are the factory workers, many of whom are women of reproductive age. They're working with reproductive toxins, carcinogens, and more. Now I ask you, what kind of woman of reproductive age would work in a job exposed to reproductive toxins except for a woman with no other option? And that's one of the beauties of this system. The erosion of local environments and economies here ensures a constant supply of people with no other option. Globally, 200,000 people a day are moving from environments that have sustained them for generations into cities, many to live in slums, looking for work, no matter how toxic that work may be. So you see, it's not just resources that are wasted along this system, but people too. Whole communities get wasted. Yep, toxics in, toxics out. A lot of the toxics leave the factories in products, but even more leave as byproducts or pollution. And it's a lot of pollution. In the U.S., our industry admits to releasing over 4 billion pounds of toxic chemicals a year. And it's probably a lot more, because that's only what they admit. So that's another limit, because yuck, who wants to look at and smell 4 billion pounds of toxic chemicals a year? So what do they do? Move the dirty factories overseas. Pollute someone else's land. End quote. Yeah, what a world. All of this is horrible. But these are topics better considered in our second Anthropology of Waste module, dealing with industrial waste. With the exception of products that off-gas toxins into the air, or products you use on your skin, or the uh, flame retardant she talked about, in general, what we bring home isn't as dangerous as what the manufacturing products process leaves behind in the communities where people are forced to produce this stuff. Environmental injustices mostly occur at the sites of manufacture. And providing you don't burn the material you consume or bury it in your backyard, leaving clean, sorted garbage on your property, properly covered, isn't going to have much of a health impact on you or your environment. It is in the disposal of your household wastes that they cause their huge problems, which is why authors like McDonough and Brungart champion the cradle-to-cradle -cradle model that seeks to define everything as a type of nutrient. As the University of Limerick's Contemporary Design Culture course in Ireland tells it, and I'll use my Irish accent, in the cradle-to-cradle -cradle model, all materials used in industrial or commercial processes, such as metals, fibers, dyes, fall into one of two categories, technical or biological nutrients. Technical nutrients are strictly limited to non-toxic, non-harmful synthetic materials that have no negative effects on the natural environment. They can be used in continuous cycles as the same product without losing their integrity or quality. In this manner, these materials can be used over and over again instead of being downcycled into lesser products, ultimately becoming waste. Biological nutrients are organic materials that once used can be disposed of in any natural environment and decompose into the soil, providing food for small life forms without affecting the natural environment. This is dependent on the ecology of the region, 
For example, organic material from one country or landmass may be harmful to the ecology of another country or landmass. The two types of materials each follow their own recycle cycle in the regenerative economy, end quote. You just have to forgive me, I'm a Culhane, County Limerick is where we come from. Now, cradle to cradle is unabashedly circular. And if we can keep the technical and biological cycles from overlapping in dangerous ways, industrial ecologies should be able to thrive alongside natural ecologies, and we can envision a regenerative economy where households no longer dispose of anything, but simply give back to each cycle the nutrients it needs when it needs them. There would be no garbage pickup, just technical nutrient pickup. In my opinion, the biological nutrients should stay in the community entirely to help produce new food and natural ecosystems there, at home. So there's one point that the story of stuff tries to drive home throughout its presentation that I want to unpack and actually contradict here. Lennox says, quote, We are running out of resources. We are using too much stuff. Now, I know this can be hard to hear, but it's the truth, so we've got to deal with it. In the past three decades alone, one third of the planet's natural resource space has been consumed. Gone. End quote. Well, not quite gone, Annie. Transformed. Rendered into a form that most industries may no longer consider valuable enough en soi to recover, but not gone. Industrial ecology doesn't see anything as gone. Even burned, the chemicals resulting from the combustion of our so-called garbage isn't gone. If it were, we wouldn't have the greenhouse effect or pollution and its toxic legacy. The chemical residuals are still here on Earth, not gone. And in many cases, they're wrecking havoc. And in other cases, they aren't causing us that many problems so long as they don't get into our waterways. But we just don't want them around in their current used form. They take up space and we think they look ugly. But gone? Out of sight, out of mind, perhaps. Now, it's my goal to convince you to keep these materials present at all times and work on ways to make their reinsertion into the industrial and natural ecology groups economically and environmentally feasible. That means hanging on to as much of it as you can for as long as you can until we figure out the best way to do that. I don't like what they're doing with nuclear waste, only this stuff isn't going to hurt you. Consider that your semester challenge. When it comes to most of the plastic we waste, I will grant you that we need affordable plastic shredders for our homes and communities. Otherwise, the bulk is too much. They should be available at every school and local library, but they're not. Volume reduction is a huge need because when we toss our plastic residuals into the garbage and claim our waste bin is full and needs to be taken out, we're mostly throwing away air. A plastic shredder turns all that volume into a fine powder or into packable granules. Without a grinder shredder, it's hard to store a lot of plastic material before you get overwhelmed by the sheer bulk of it all. But once shredded, you truly can claim that a barrel of single-use plastic residuals is really a barrel of oil equivalent, just a whole lot cleaner and safer. There are other advantages to shredding plastic. If you don't want to store it as a future hedge against inflation or turn it into oil, ironically, I've found that if you do invest the time and energy in converting back into oil, People accept that you would store oil more than storing solid plastic, even though the latter is safer and odor-free. Again, it has to do with our cultural expectations and notions of value. We store ours uh, to use in our hurricane lamp, for example, and we've run our weed whacker on the plastic oil for a couple of weeks before it stopped working, probably due to carburetor damage from the unrefined crude oil we produced. If you cleaned and separated plastic and you shred thermoplastics like number two, HDPE, things like bottle caps, for example, or number five, polypropylene, found in yogurt containers and plastic form forks and spoons and coat hangers, you can actually turn the flakes into 3D printing filament using machines like the Philobot or the Protocycler. It turns out the number two, three, and five plastics are so easy to work with that here at the Rosebud Continuum, We've even begun making durable classroom and wildlife trail signs out of them. Former GLOBE students, club leaders from Patel, Kiana Sladicki and Folarunsu Tosinester and Franklin Durake, got school kids to gather bottle caps from beaches over several weeks as an environmental cleanup effort, sorted them by color, and then spent time shredding them and feeding them into the Philobot, the USF 3D Access Lab, and turning them into 3D printer filament. For quality reasons, they turned from this effort to instead melting the plastic caps into a gooey taffy in their dorm room, at, in their oven, 
at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and then rolling and pressing it into flat signs, which they later painted and carved using our robotic CNC mill x carve at Rosebud, showing the potential. Later, students Sierra Rains and Lydia at Iwo refined the technique using a new press that the Rosebud staff had built and a hand sander to make them smooth and shiny. Their research showed the value of hanging on to all the HDPE and polypropylene plastic you can, while Culhane made a weekly habit of turning his, my, number sevens into crude oil for the hurricane lamp. And Paul Duffenbach, another student, worked with Culhane, me at Rosebud, to build a small aluminum smelter which they used to turn all the aluminum cans into ingots and cool objects. There's so much research to be done, but the point is that with 100% of your organic waste able to be easily turned back into fuel and fertilizer at home, the aluminum is easy to recycle at home or sell, the other metals and glass easy to sell, the cardboard and paper, even the soiled pizza boxes, all useful as mulch in the garden, and much of the plastic is useful for sign making or 3D printing or oil making at home or in the community. There's no reason to have a domestic waste problem at all. It all comes down to attitude, and that's an anthropological thing, not a technical thing. My thought is that perhaps we're looking at the whole situation backwards. Maybe instead of trying to reduce the amount of material we bring home so our so-called waste can fit in one mason jar, we should instead get greedy about it and see how much we can take off businesses' hands until they start noticing and charging us for it and fully owning it themselves. Right now they're giving us free cardboard and paper, free glass, free metal and free oil in the form of safely storable plastic. What a bargain, huh? In my world I imagine standing on the front porch with a shotgun and saying to any municipal garbage collector who comes for it, Ch -ch -ch, hey, you don't get my shit. This is my shit. I went to Walmart and spent my precious time shopping for it. I bought it and paid for it and brought it home. I paid for this here banana peel, and I paid for the banana that went through me to become shit. I paid for the plastic wrappers and the bags and bottles and packaging. My fruit and vegetables and detergents came in. I had to haul them here and carry them inside. The hell I'm going to give them to you for free, and you ain't taking them without a fight. Ch -ch -ch. This here's my private property, so get the heck off my land. You don't get my shit. Ch -ch -ch. Imagine if we all took that attitude toward the production and consumption residuals we accumulate and started deliberately accumulating them as forms of stored capital and net present and future value. Is that the point when William McDonough's cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy might kick in with manufacturers owning their shit and merely renting us products and taking back all their packaging as Aldi does in Germany? Isn't this really just a cultural thing when it comes down to it? with America leading the pack of package discarding wasteful cultures? So next time you ask yourself, why do we have a garbage problem in the world? It helps to look in the mirror and ask yourself, what tribe am I in? What kind of culture have I let myself fall into that does such weird and unnecessary sacrifices? One day, the strange and barbaric and wasteful practice of throwing things away will seem as primitive as it is. Until then, you can follow our lead and recognizing that we are not professionals with fancy factories or equipment, but just citizens like you, please do try this at home.